medical doctor and an epidemiologist by background. And I am uh, from Switzerland. I am uh, uh, the director of the Institute of Global Health uh, at the University of Geneva. So I am very happy uh, to uh, give this lecture to you. Although I imagine you can be a bit tired at the end of the week and the end of the day. So uh, we will uh, try to be under understanding. And, and um, if you have any uh, question, you can, of course, interrupt me whenever you want. But w I will uh, also give some floor for, for discussion after my, my talk. I will try to talk about uh, yes, the challenges, the global health challenges we are facing and we will be facing in the coming future and uh, its solutions. But before, I would like to say that um, this domain of global health is particularly in good shape. Maybe you are used to say that everything is going bad and so on. But you no, know, in terms of global health, in various dimensions, the poverty along the centuries has dramatically been reduced almost to zero severe extreme poverty in the world now, almost eradication of extreme poverty. The basic education has improved quite well and it's very important for health to have uh, resources and education, literacy also. Democracy is not so good, it's maybe half of the world lives with more or less stage of democracy, it could improve. Vaccination is a new uh, uh, action, uh, intervention in public health and global health, but it has also dramatically increased. vaccinate all the world, even the, the poorest segment of the world. And child mortality, I will come back to that, has also been dramatically reduced in the, in the past decades. We have more than double the life expectancy in every single country since almost one century. Double. It's not a small increase in. No, we have doubled. So we, are, we have really succeeded. It, it was not always, uh, I would say, a quiet journey. Uh, you can see here this accident in life expectancy in Africa. Do you know what was the cause? What Do you have an idea of what was the cause? AIDS epidemic. AIDS, yes. Unfortunately, the AIDS epidemic did really uh, impact the, the life expectancy. But they wrap up quickly. Of course, there are still some uh, discrepancy between s Europe, for instance, where we have more than 80 years of life expectation, life expectancy, uh, when in Africa it's 60. These differences have not been solved in, from, from the past. It was the same, almost the same uh, proportion I in the past century. So. We have, of course, room for progression. I'm not saying it's acceptable, but at least every single country has, has increased. With the COVID pandemic, it has been slowed, but probably it will wrap up again. In Geneva, again, we have, when I say we, uh, I mean WHO, the World Health Organization, has succeeded to eradicate smallpox. It's interesting the case of smallpox. First of all, in terms of casualty, of death toll, smallpox has killed only in the 20th century 300 million people, more than all the wars and the genocides and the famines together. So smallpox fortunately, has been totally eradicated from the planet. There is no more smallpox on the planet. There is monkeypox, yes, but it's not smallpox. Smallpox was a terrible disease with a high mortality. And fortunately, thanks to the vaccine, it has been eradicated by WHO. There are not so many. It's almost the only one disease which has been successfully eradicated by WHO. And it is also interesting because it was in 1958 when the Russian government asked to the WHO board, which is the board of WHO is all the 194 government member states. And 
you, you, rem you imagine in 1958, we were in the middle of the Cold War, just before the Cuba's things and so on. You know, it was quite a difficult world. Because sometimes you may say or think we are in a very difficult situation, politically instable today, and we cannot succeed to have any achievement. It's not true, <coughs> particularly in the field of health. You are economist, you want to succeed in economy, you can use sometimes health as a, a diplomatic tool or a soft diplomacy for succeeding your, your things. Many people say that, for instance, for the climate change, it could be a, 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 a useful path. <coughs> Child mortality, as I told you, has been reduced also dramatically. Half halving of the, uh, of the child mortality in three decades, it's quite quite a good achievement. And it is mainly thanks to the vaccines in many diseases. So the vaccine hesitancy today, which is spreading all over the world as an anti-vax movement, is jeopardizing these, these achievements. And last but not the least of the, the, the four achievements I wanted to, to show is uh, the poliomyelitis. Poliomyelitis, just at the end of the 80s, did Took, did take um, <coughs> 350,000 per paralysis per year in children. These paralysis were sequelae for all the lives. It destroyed, poliomyelitis viruses destroyed lives. And nowadays it is almost eradicated, not completely, since at the end, uh, just before the pandemic, uh, COVID pandemic occur, did occur, only three countries were reporting cases. Now it is uh, almost similar between Pakistan and Afghanistan and some countries in Africa sometimes report some, some cases. When you report some cases, that means that the virus is still circulating. It is not eradicated. So we need to push a bit the, the, the ambition to eradicate poliomyelitis, but it is not yet achieved. In Pakistan and Afghanistan, the governments have made a lot of efforts now to try to eradicate it. But I want to, to talk with you about new challenges which are uh, coming and which are often not really considered by the, the, the global health policy as they could. First of all, of course, particularly currently during the COP28, I want to talk about climate change, of course. I want to talk about climate change. I am uh, happy to see that one of the best MOOC, you know, massive open online course, which have been delivered, was not delivered by uh, the Institute of Global Health everywhere in the world, was not de delivered by doctors, was delivered by economists from the World Bank. This MOOC has been done by by the World Bank on climate change. And there are a lot of things on, on relation between climate change and health. The Lancet, which is a very good journal in, in medicine and, and, and health, has said that, in fact, the, the climate change issue could be the, great, the greatest global health opportunity. It could be an opportunity. And we will see why this challenge can be also an opportunity. No, no, don't, don't worry. There are some places in the world which cannot be uh, livable anymore. This is particularly the case of some part of the Horn of Africa, where the drought and the heat waves are so strong that you cannot work anymore outside, you cannot live anymore outside. This generates civil conflicts and sometimes wars. Many people say that the wars in Syria was more or less due to the climate change consequences. Because it becomes unlivable, you start to look at your neighbor countries. Of course, there are the jihadism, there are the, 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 these extremism, which are, we, fundamentalism, which, uh, were, which grew in this soil. But what I want to tell you is that it is also a hotspot of the climate change impact today, this part of the world. And 
unsurprisingly, this is a, a, a spot where the war did occur. The second uh, thing is the mosquito-borne disease. Mosquito-borne disease, <laughs> excuse me, mosquito-borne disease are affected by climate change, of course, because you understand that mosquitoes are uh, multiplying better in wet and sometimes in, in uh, hot uh, or at least warm conditions. It has been seen, for instance, that in, uh, in Zimbabwe, for instance, the, the, the capital is on the highland. It has been settled on the highland because it was much more comfortable to live in the highlands, less warm, the mosquito uh, uh, anopheles, which is, uh, which is um, transmitting malaria, was not able to m multiply very well, and so people were safe, and they are no more safe because of the climate change and the global warming. So to some extent, we can see that also for dengue vector. Dengue vector is, ano is um, Aedes, and the Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus are also proliferating much more with the climate change. And they are vector of dengue, but also of chikungunya, of Zika, of yellow fever. So you can see that these vectors are really a threat for the humanity. We are now in Paris uh, observing some dengue vector. And, and we have in, 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 in France here, they, they have re reported the highest number of dengue cases this year. So it is increasing. So there is, th th this risk is now really uh, crossing the boundaries and, and not contained in the tropical area. The crops, I wanted to show you also the fact that the climate change uh, also did affect, uh, no, not did, is affecting crops and cereals, but not equally. You can see that some region of the world will really suffer up to minus 50% of their huge, usual crops when some countries, particularly Russia, Ukraine, uh, Canada will benefit from the climate change because, of course, it will be warmer in these, in these septentrional countries, in these north countries. So the impact of climate change on health is not only the mosquito-borne uh, disease. Of course it is, as I mentioned, but it is much broader. When I mentioned the civil, civil uh, conflicts, uh, it affects health because of trauma, because of injuries, because of disease, because of refugees uh, who may have s spread of disease and so on. Um, we can see that storms and floodings, and we can associate also extreme weather events, are very difficult to cope with. It's easier to cope with an incremental increase in temperature. You know, here in Paris, summers are longer, Winters are shorter and less, less cold. It's acceptable. Sometimes it's even enjoyable. But when there are some extreme weather events, flooding or hurricanes or heat waves, even in France, a developed country like France has lost in 2003 uh, 15,000 people among the elderly because of the heat waves, and particularly here in Paris. So even the rich countries cannot cope so well with uh, extreme weather events. So this is a, a real, real issue. Air pollutants are not directly a consequence of climate change. But you know, climate change is due mainly the, to greenhouse gas emissions and the same fossil fuels which are producing the greenhouse gas are also producing um, fine particle matters. And these fine particle matters are air pollutants and are very bad for uh, respiratory disease, but also cardiovascular disease, and also cancer, and also uh, uh, neurologic and Alzheimer disease. I will come back on that. And food supply, as I mentioned. The second challenge we are facing is demography. And when I'm saying demography, some people are thinking that it is more important to face a challenge on demography than on climate change in terms of health today because of the population growth, 
we are becoming 8 billion, we will probably become 10 billion people when the planet had only less than 2 billion at the beginning of the 20th century. So we need to live, we need, we need to eat, we need to... Uh, our, the, the eat we are eating is sometimes animals, they need to eat also, and so deforestation and, and land use and pollution, air pollution, but also ocean pollution and so on, is the consequence of this demography. Aging is another consequence. I will come back on aging just after. And urbanization, it's not only pessimistic. Thanks to the urbanizations, you have access to education, to healthcare, to um, culture, uh, to many social activities much more easily than if you are secluded in a rural area or in the mountain of Switzerland. So it's much easier to be in a city and it's, it's also better for health. Most of the people who are living in urban areas now are living longer than in rural uh, areas. So I'm not saying that urbanization is only problems, but it's a source of, of problems like <coughs> air pollution, at least. About aging, what I wanted to say is maybe we have to look I will come back on that, but all the countries will face aging. It's not only Japan or these kind of countries. But what is sure is Japan, and to some extent South Korea and China, are suffering from a very rapid aging. And in Japan, the UN United Nations said in a report in 2000 that they had two options, either to welcome immigrants, but not small amount of immigrants, 50 million, 1 million per year for 50 years, or to delay the age of retirement. Do you know what they have chosen? Because they have decided this year. Second one. Second one. Yeah. And what is the age of retirement in Japan now, 2023? They have decided it will be more than that, 80. <laughs> no, Japanese are not French, for sure. And nobody went in the street. Even some were not very happy. You know why? It's because why do you put an, an age retirement limit? They wanted more. <laughs> so, uh, but it, yeah, you know, it's not completely true. They are, uh, the, the pension is given after 65 in Japan, but they can work up to, to 80s. And in fact, the French do not tell you that, but they are allowed also to work up to 80s if they want, when they are retired. It's, it, in, France, in French, it is named cumul emploi retraite. So they, they do not say that openly, but you can work up to 80s in, in France too. But, uh, so, but you receive your pension at 64, I think, now. It so it, it depends, slowly. Oh, it depends also. So, um, but just to tell you, the Japanese do not want immigrants to come. But this is not. The Europeans are welcoming much more immigrants. In Switzerland, in, in Geneva, half of the population is not Swiss. So, uh, of course, uh, immigration, and uh, it's just to, to keep the dependency ratio that economically uh, immigration or uh, age of retirement is an issue. One health, planetary health, you have heard about that, probably, or maybe not. It's an approach which wants to send a message, to say, listen, the health is not a matter of medical doctors only. Of course, for our health, we need medical doctors. But medical doctors are <coughs> trained in a silo, which is human health. But most of the health issues are coming from animals, mosquitoes I mentioned, but bats and, and sometimes monkeys and so on, Ebola, uh, COVID, all these issues are coming from the animals. So we need to have a one health approach which combine um, both, I would say, the, the health of humans, the health of animals and the health of ecosystems. So if you want to understand better health issues, you need absolutely to combine, to have an approach which combines all these domains. And there, is, there was a 
tripartite and now a quadripartite alliance because WHO, the UN system, was also in silos. WHO is a World Health Organization, it's not two. It's a World Health Organization for human health. And there is a World Health Organization for animal health. Do you know where it is, the headquarters? You should, it is here in Paris. You could visit them. And there is uh, the FAO, you know where is the FAO? In Rome, yeah. yeah. And in Rome you have the, the FAO, which is uh, uh, among this uh, quadripartite alliance, and the next one is about uh, environment, UNEP. And so these four uh, organization, UN organizations are working together now to try to tackle these issues. And planetary health is about uh, climate change for sure, and all these issues which are damaging the planet, not only climate change, also plastic pollution, and all the, the, wa the water use, and all, all these issues which are affecting the planet. Because we have to think that there is no health of the human without health of the planet. So this respect of the planet is something which has now to be embedded in the, in the global health challenges we are facing. Just to tell you, 70% of the emerging infectious diseases are coming from animals. The reason why when we, we say we need this quadripartite alliance, it's not just uh, fashionable. It's really because we need to think together. You may not have heard about all these diseases which were emerging one day or another, but some, and some are have fancy names like West Nile, West Nile virus. What, what is West Nile? The West Nile is in Egypt, uh, not in Egypt, in Southern, I, I would say, but it, it is it's a wrong name. You know, we do not like now to name the viruses by a place, a location. Ebola is a, a river in, in Africa. Zika is also a forest in Africa. We, we don't want to, to say that anymore. So COVID is not the Chinese virus as Trump used to say. And but yes, please. Um, given this picture, one could have the impression that it's actually good that insects are dying and we are less exposed to animals. But like I, I assume that I, I know that it's not true. But like, how do we uh, like balance the fact that we are less exposed to mosquitoes and like other insects in especially in urban areas, and therefore like less exposed to this with the increased risk of mutations? which I don't really know anything about, but I know that it is a problem in terms of like health that we have less biodiversity. So Yeah, it's a very good question. You you are just calling for complexity and saying that it's it's more complex probably than just killings of mosquitoes. What is true is that there is many, many mosquitoes which do not which are not vectors of any disease, any any virus or, or pathogens. Most of the mosquitoes may beat you without any problems in terms of transmittable disease. So it may be uncomfortable, but they will never, they will never transmit you any disease. Some mosquitoes transmit some diseases. First of all, only the female mosquito transmits the disease. Why? Because you are only bitten by the female mosquitoes. They need some blood for uh, delivering their eggs, it's, uh, for, for having proteins. Because usually mosquitoes just take their food on the flowers and, and the, the fruits. So um, um, th those mosquitoes which are dangerous for our health are very well known. Some of them are more in rural areas like uh, Anopheles for malaria. One of the reasons why malaria is declining in spite of the, the global warming is because we are more and more urbanized and less and less living in rural areas. So to some extent, what you said is true. But Aedes albopictus or Aedes aegypti, it's almost the opposite. It's a mosquito which is well fitted for urban areas. So in urban areas, we are not protected against these mosquitoes. Of course, when we are in very developed countries, living inside with air condition and so on, Mosquitoes are, will not come in, inside. And because we are not, it's not warm enough, we, are, we have some clothes and that also fight against mosquitoes. So we are not fearing such big epidemics of, 
of dengue in Paris. I'm not thinking about that. But what is true is that these mosquitoes may affect many countries or in summertime when people have uh, short leaves and, 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 and could, be, uh, could be bitten by, by, by the mosquito. So um, what is true also is that the mosquitoes have a role for the biodiversity for the sake of also pollinization. And so we, we need not to spray insecticide and, and, and kill all the mosquitoes. We need them. We need, you know, sometimes we have, because we, we are too much in silos, we have wrong ideas. You may not know that, I, I assume that all of you, you are calling yourself human being. But you could call yourself bacterian being. Why? Because you have more bacteria in terms of numbers of cells. You have more bacteria than human cells. We have more bacteria in our bodies than human cells. So when we think bacteria are our enemies, it is wrong. Bacteria are our friends. First of all, we, we feed them every day. And second, if you had no bacteria, tomorrow you will be dead. Bacteria allows you to stay in life. It's because you have a lot of bacteria in your gut that you can just eat what you want. It's because of your bacteria in your mouth. You have 10 billion bacteria in your mouth. 10 billion. So, of course, every, everything here is plenty of your bacteria, my bacteria, and so on. But our bacteria are, we are bacterians. More, more than humans. <laughs> so, the animals. Animals, there is 1.6 million yet to be discovered viruses in animals today. And it's a rough approximation. So, the, when you say what will be the next, when will be the next pandemic, we don't know, but we are completely sure there will be a next pandemic of a new virus, maybe a corona or any, or any other virus. Of course, it will happen. I, we don't know when, we don't know. So the reason why also we need to have uh, a good surveillance of these bacteria, viruses in animals, to know what could emerge and to know what to do. A fourth challenge could be around uh, one of the consequences I mentioned about civil conflicts or wars, uh, it's about migration and refugees. Here, this is a city, if I can say, it's a refugee camp, which is the size of the city of Geneva. 250,000 uh, people living in, in this refugee camp, Kakuma, the name, in Kenya. And they have primary education, they have secondary education, quite well, quite acceptable. But most of them were born 25 years ago and are now 25 years, and they do not benefit from any tertiary education like you. They don't have universities, and they cannot move from the camp. They are not allowed to go to the University of Nairobi or in Kenya or anywhere else. It's not allowed. So they are suffering from that. We know, uh, we have here, it is the campus of the University of Geneva there. It's of course a poor campus, but at least we deliver some, yeah, some degrees and some, some, some credits and they can try to, to get some, some degrees. We, we, are aware, we were aware of a young man. He was a pharmacist in the camp. He was really a held, uh, trained as a pharmacist by, by, you know, by the field experience on the camp. 250,000, you need pharmacists. So the UN are delivering drugs, but you need to deliver drugs with a pharmacist. And he was acting as a pharmacist. And at 25 or 30, he was allowed to move, to come back to his country in South Sudan. So he went back to his village. And they said, welcome, we're very happy to see you and, and um, your, your family, uh, nobody in your family, of your family is still here, but w what were, we, were you doing? I was a pharmacist. Oh, good, we need pharmacists. Do you have a degree? No, no, I don't. Oh, if you don't have a degree, you cannot be a pharmacist in our country. So please, you can be a taxi driver. 
and he is now a taxi driver. So it's a pity. So they want to have some degree. So we need to think about this. This is a challenge. And you know, I'm mixing a bit global health, education, and resources because it's, it's mixed. So it's not only about wars. It's also about extreme weather event. Not only weather. Sometimes <laughs> it's earthquake or things like that. It's not really due to climate change. So we are facing these issues. And uh, we, we, are, yeah, we, we see the, the movement of many people to, for freedom and, and, and also for, for women in iron here. I want to talk about a fifth challenge, which is quite uh, important for us. The challenge I'm mentioning is about disinformation. We are facing, and you will face in the coming years, for sure, the challenge of disinformation and misinformation. So misinformation and disinformation was particularly visible during the COVID pandemic. It killed. And you will apolog apologize me, I will apologize at least, for being a bit political here, political oriented. I cannot be neutral. Just to tell you, it's about the USA. The Republicans were, up until the 2000, the year 2000, they were trusty in science, in the scientific community, more than the Democrats. The Democrats usually are a bit less educated, less wealthy also. And they were less educated and less prone to believe in science. But during the Obama era and after, they dramatically progressed in the direction of faithful to science. When the Republicans, after the Trump and so on, the populism did not believe at all in the science. And what did occur during the pandemic? Before the, the pandemic, there was no difference in mortality between Republicans and Democrats. You can vote what you want, that will not kill you. But after the pandemic, in the first phase of the pandemic, without any vaccines, the Democrats did die more than the Republicans. And one of the reasons is that the Democrats were poorer and were more exposed than the Republicans to the virus without any vaccines and uh, any protection. They were with more unstable contracts, and so they did not say when they were ill, and so they were not treated well, and so on. But when the vaccine appeared, the vaccine was for free for anyone in America. So the vaccine was well taken by the Democrats, because they believed in science and in, in the messages of science and the, of the scientific community, when the Republicans did not. And the Republicans were killed by their opinion. So because and it has been clearly seen in, in the states where the double vaccinated share of the population was much lower than uh, for the others. But it has been also true in Germany, in France, and not in the UK. For the UK, I don't know if it is they were proud of their vaccine, but in the USA, they could have been proud of their vaccine, and uh, I don't know why. There is a, a website of anti-vax people who said, no, I was wrong to be anti-vax, and they, they say sorry for that, and do not follow my stupid ID. And uh, this one also shows the vaccination, vaccination rates between counties which were blue, means Democrats, or red means Republicans. And uh, you can see really a real correlation. So uh, it's very important to see that the Democrats were much more vaccinated and were saved by the vaccines when the Republicans were killed by this populism. Yeah. Um, just a quick remark on these political points. Are we, um, does it uh, take in consideration the urban-rural divide? Because I believe that Democrats tend to be more urban in more, more locations, more urban density, urban, urban centers, while Republicans more in uh, countryside. Uh, do, do this data control for that? 
Um, it's a good question. I don't know. I, I cannot tell you exactly. What I said is, has been published in the uh, Financial Times, but it was uh, driven by a School of Public Health of Yale. And so it was properly done, met methodologically. But I think it's a very good point. Um, I assume that the Republicans from Boston and from Massachusetts, for, I mean, highly educated people, were not uh, among these red lines. So you see, there is also some, some discrepancies eh, between and a distribution. It's, it's more statistical than completely. It's not because you have a, a red belt in that you, you will be killed, of course. You, you, you're right. We have, there are some, probably some, some things to weigh. What it was also very interesting to see is that, and it is a key working paper which was published in May 22, which show that they, they just assessed the various um, uh, non-pharmaceutical uh, intervention which were used during the pandemic and the early stage of the pandemic, school closing, test policies, contact tracing, uh, you know, international travel controls and so on. The best measure, the most effective measure was public information campaign, meaning that we need to go to stage as uh, academics with evidence and to show that to the public because it saves lives. It's one of the best and the most important measure. The sixth challenge I wanted to talk with you is about inequality and equity and inequity. Uh, we have to, to know the difference between inequality and inequity. Equality is when you give the same amount of resource to everyone. I give you 10 euros to everyone so you can buy something, a drink or something after the, call, the lecture. It's something which is good, we appreciate that, but it does not solve the problem of the most vulnerable, the smallest. When the equity is to say, no, the, the tallest one do not need, does not need this 10 francs or 10 euros, but you should give your 30 euros in a, uh, an unequal manner, which allows for equity, which allows the smallest really to see the match. And um, this concept of inequality is maybe the most obvious and the most unacceptable uh, with regard with greenhouse gas emission. You can see here the greenhouse gas emissions are not equally distributed. The countries which emit the most are, of course, the richest countries. Europe, States, Americas, and, and also uh, China. When the countries which suffered the most, and it's not new, it's death rate in, uh, the in the 20, in, in the 2000s, in the year 2000. So it's WHO year 2000, 25 years ago, we can see that there is a, a completely unbalanced distribution of the effect of climate change on health. Those who are not emitting are suffering the most. So they are now at the COP28, they are saying we need reparation, we need and the needy. You need to pay the rich countries. And we can understand that. And we can understand that when we see this figure. This figure is about the same as a map. It is to say that the top 10% countries, richest countries, have, are suffering the less of the consequence of the losses due to the climate change when they are emitting almost half of the greenhouse gas emission, only the 10% of them are emitting 48%, but they can afford to cope with the losses. If there is a flooding in Paris, it is possible that it will not destroy the capital. They can afford. When the bottom 50%, I'm not talking about the poorest of the poorest, the poorest of the poor, here is the 50% poorest are really suffering for three quarters of the losses, and they are not the most emitters. They are emitting only 12% of the emission, and they do not have any finance to comp compensate these losses. 
So we, we see this inequality, and this inequality is a real challenge. Seven challenge I wanted to talk with you is about artificial intelligence data science. OpenAI, uh, ChatGPT, uh, it's a challenge. Not, I'm not saying that we are suffering from that. We, I think we may benefit from it. But and I, I will show you a couple of examples where artificial intelligence may really help solving uh, the problems. Do not be fascinated by innovation or by artificial intelligence. It's a tool, but do not hesitate to use, to use them. In, in medicine, or in at least uh, 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 health sector, we have seen, for instance, the, the, this is, they are, these are the radiologists from Stanford University. They are beaten by artificial intelligence today. So now you have tools in artificial intelligence which reads mammography or uh, chest radiography better than a radiologist, or equally. Of course, many radiologists are against that. Say, no, we should not, you know, we, uh, the doctors should be here to deliver the diagnosis. You will not learn from a, uh, an engine that you have a cancer. It's not human. It's true. But just believe me, in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there is less than one radiologist per million people. They would benefit a lot from these tools. I'm not saying about Stanford, California, or Switzerland. We don't need maybe these tools. Although, I would prefer to have a radiologist using this tool, challenging him. Maybe he has not seen uh, a diagnosis, and he may be help. He may challenge it, say, no, no, I don't believe this engine or this deep learning machine, and I prefer to tell you that you have nothing. But at least he will have both. But even if we have only one, that could be useful. I know a couple of diseases which are very well treated in, in North countries and which are not treated in uh, sub-Saharan or low and middle income countries, not only sub-Saharan Africa, just because they are not diagnosed and just because have, there is no pathologist or no radiologist to make the diagnosis. So if they can be helped by artificial intelligence, they may make some progress. The second point is this digital revolution, which is already impacting global health. First of all, I will give you three examples, because there are so many. But three examples. The first one is remote sensing data. It's satellites. So the satellites are providing remote sensing data on many, many issues. Here, it's not about health, it's about NDVI, which means the anomalies of vegetation. The vegetation can be usual, business as usual, it's standard, it's yellow. When it is too dry, it is red. And when it is too wet, it is green. So green here, for three consecutive weeks, it's provided by the NASA, it is too wet for three consecutive months, excuse me. It means that probably it's flooding or something like that. But there are some epidemiological studies which have been done after that, showing that when for three consecutive months at the Horn of Africa, you have a green shadow like that sent by the NASA for free, you can say that there will be a high risk of malaria outbreaks, of um, rift valley fever, and of cholera. Rift valley fever is an hemorrhagic fever, like Ebola, which attack both the human being and the cattle. So uh, in the Horn of Africa, the Kenya, the country, the Kenya, said now to WHO, please, we want to use this data. And when there is this signal, three consecutive months, we ring the bell and ask to the global community to help us vaccinating our cattle, for instance, against Rift Valley fever, or to fight against mosquito. It's, it's a good time to fight against mo mosquito, and so on. A mosquito for malaria. Uh, so uh, it's just to say that um, this kind of data, remote sensing data, may be used today for a purpose of global health, which is quite new, just because, you know, the, 
the medical doctors didn't use to attend to the Congress, the conference, scientific conference of the, the NASA. It's not the usual partners. So thanks to this global health, one health approach, planetary health approach, now we can tackle these, these issues much more comprehensively. Second point, you may remember or not, in 2015, there was an outbreak of Ebola in Western Africa. Médecins Sans Frontières was an NGO which identified it very early, and they rang the bell. And the global community really came on stage and tried to tackle the issue. MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, wanted to help and to treat the patients. And they asked to the government in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and also Guinea-Bissau, they asked, where are the people? Where are the cities? Where should we implement our, our, camp, our treatment centers? And they said, we don't have any census data. We don't know. We don't know exactly. There are people are moving, you know. They are nomads. They are moving. We don't know. And the mobile phone operators said, we know where they are. They are where they are calling, where they are phoning. So we can give you our mobile phone data, and you will see where people are living or moving. And you may implement your, your uh, treatment centers exactly at the same location. And that's what MSF did. There, were, there was a question? No, at the back, no. Uh, last, last story is about drones. Drones are usually used for military reasons, but they can be used for the good too. Zipline was an American company from California. You may know Zipline or not, but Zipline wanted to ship pizzas to Californians. But uh, air traffic control said, no way, you will not ship pizza in California. <laughs> So they moved to Africa, and to Africa they met uh, the various uh, heads of governments and, and states. And when they met uh, Paul Kagame from Rwanda, he told them, yes, my sky is free for you except the, the sector of the international airport of Kigali, but you can, you can ship not pizza, we don't need them, but we, you can ship blood products and vaccines. And there were some interest from philanthropists because Zipline was not philanthropists. They were, it was a startup and they wanted to make business. So they just negotiate the price. We will ship the blood product at the same price as if that was a motorcycle, but that will be with drones. And the drones were very effective. It's these drones flying quickly Rwanda is a small country like Switzerland, so in 45 minutes you can ship blood products respectful of the cold chain or vaccines and uh, you can you know, manufacture the, the blood products at the capital in Kigali with good standard of quality and some health offic officials uh, can ask by text message to, uh, to the drone company that they need some blood products in emergency because a lady, a woman is uh, delivering, for instance, and bl bleeding, so needs very urgently some blood products and can be saved by that. And more than 8,000 blood products have been delivered last year thanks to that. Just two minutes before delivering the, the product, the drone is automatically sending a text message to the, um, to the medical officer and uh, to say, okay, we will deliver it. And he show up and takes the, the, the blood product. And the drone does not land, just turn and come back to its base, where it is um, refueled in electricity power by solar panels to be respectful of the planet. So it's a very, very interesting model. And it has been now uh, adopted by Ghana. Ghana is deploying it. Uh, Rwanda has completely deployed it for, for a couple of years now. And Ghana is doing it now, and, and India too. So you can see there are some impacts already now. And 
My last point is about prevention. I, I don't know if I have still time, or maybe we should stop a bit. No, you can finish the presentation. I finish the presentation? Yeah. So prevention is a major challenge. Why? Mostly because of that. I jo just told about aging. You know, I, told, I just told you that Japanese are aging a bit more fast than us. But all the world is aging, and the proportion of countries which will be above 60 years will be almost all the world, except maybe Sub-Saharan Africa. So we are all concerned by aging, and that means we need prevention. Why? Because the major challenge is not to become old, is to become old in good health. So it's not so much life expectancy which is so important to keep, it's a healthy life years. I like this paper from the Lancet, the Lancet Commission in 2020 uh, published a paper on what are the determinants of Alzheimer's disease. I cannot pose all the preventive measures, but for at least for Alzheimer's <laughs> disease, these 12 determinants are influencing 40% of Alzheimer's disease. Meaning that if you try to control these 12 points, you will not succeed to eradicate Alzheimer's disease. You will succeed to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And we will browse them quickly together to see that it's all along the life. It's a life course issue. First, smoking tobacco. Smoking tobacco in the world, you can see, it's really largely uh, expanded. Uh, smoking tobacco, it's a question of economy. If you lower the taxes, the excess taxes on tobacco, you increase the consumption. That was in South Africa. Clearly visible. Politicians, when they do not agree to increase the taxes on tobacco, they are facing an increase in tobacco consumption. What is interesting also is public health is not doing all the job. In Japan, here, in a decade, the consumption of cigarettes has decreased by 50%. It's amazing. It has never been seen anywhere in the world. A decrease of 50% of the consumption of cigarettes. And the reason is not public health. Public health is weak in Japan. The reason is tobacco company, the big tobacco, has succeeded to decrease the consumption of cigarettes. Why? Because they promoted electronic devices, electronic cigarettes, or, you know, smoke less tobacco. This is much less dangerous. It's an excellent strategy for Japan, but it's not a public health strategy. It's, yeah. And it, I'm saying that because public health community, the public health community is against uh, VAP and, and electronic cigarettes, when in fact it's a risk reduction strategy. I'm not saying that it is completely safe, I don't know still, but we are sure that it will not kill half of the users as the cigarettes do. Yes, please. Uh, I was just wondering, like, uh, because this technology only exists since like 10 years or something, yeah. like, are there already like long-term studies on the effects of vaping on like, I don't know, uh, circulation, lung function? No, no, it, you, you, it's an excellent question. No, of course, we don't have the same uh, uh, recul, de delay, I don't know, time span regarding the, 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 the vaping. Of course, some people say we should not promote vaping in non-users, but promoting vaping in smokers, in heavy smokers, it's probably very, very good. You know, the exchange of syringe is very useful for those who are IV drug users. I'm not promoting syringe exchanges in non-users. <laughs> so it's not, you see what I mean. So the, the risk reduction strategy is a good strategy for those who are in need of. So it succeeded. In fact, uh, what is interesting is that um, the, the total volumes of smokers 
in Japan has not changed because they count into the smokers those who are taking the cigarettes and those who are taking the smokeless tobacco, so both. So they consider them as smokers. Stupid, but they consider them as smokers. But what is interesting, it has not changed, meaning that they do, did not increase the numbers of users. They really switch from tobacco, smoking tobacco to smokeless tobacco. Alcohol. Alcohol also is a big issue in the world, all over the world, not equally distributed. And alcohol consumption is heavy in France. It's not as heavy in Sweden, for instance. But Sweden has the system Bolaget. Do you know? Maybe there is a Swedish here or someone from here? Yeah. I'm, I'm not Swedish, but uh, all the Scandinavian countries have like a state monopoly on all uh, liquor shops, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You cannot find alcohol in Sweden out of the system Bolaget, which is a state. Uh, after 6 p.m. on weekdays and like 1 p.m. on the weekend. Yes, it's state. Totalitarianism. Yes, state. <laughs> yeah. No, yes, it, it seems communist, <laughs> communism. It is not. It is, it, it is long lasting. It is from the 1955, I think. So, uh, of okay, we will not go to this direction in most countries and probably not in France or in Switzerland. But I like this one. Italy. Italy is similar as Sweden in terms of consumption. When France and Switzerland are very, uh, no, <laughs> yeah, Italy. When France and and uh, where is Switzerland? No, Switzerland is not here because it's not in the U EU. So uh, the alcohol consumption of um, of Italy is very very low. It's interesting because most French say, that, yes, but we have uh, lobbies of alcohol. It's because we are big producers of wine that we have this, uh, this level of alcohol consumption. But the, the Italian are the second, and sometimes some years, the first producers of, of, of wine. So it's not true for them. And one of the reasons is that I'm not completely, I've not completely explored the reasons why Italians are so low in consumption, 30% or lower than, than France. But one of the reasons is that Martini, I'm not giving advertisement on alcohol. I would not be allowed to do that. It's alcohol free in Swiss. It's, it's uh, alcohol free. It's no non-alcoholic beverage. All these, al these bo bottles are non-alcoholic beverage. You can have uh, an Aperol Spritz, you like Aperol Spritz, with that. <laughs> Zero alcohol, and with this wine, white wine, zero alcohol. I'm not saying that this white wine is very good, <laughs> but in an Aperol Spritz, you do not see the difference. <laughs> Except, you, of course, you don't have the effect of alcohol. So it's completely alcohol. -free. There are beers which are very good, huh? uh, alcohol-free. So we can have fun and can keep that uh, Italian way of life. They prefer to have fun and keep the way of life rather than uh, deprivatization of the alcohol, uh, but it seems to be successful. So that is, that is interesting. Red meat now. We are big consumers of red meat in Europe, in the States, in, in China also, in Russia. Uh, not so much in Africa, as you can see. They do not eat meat almost at all. What is unfair again is that the healthy, affordable diet, which has been well uh, presented by the Lancet, is not accessible everywhere. In, yes, in France, Switzerland, in Canada, in the USA, it is affordable. But in Africa, it's almost not affordable to eat well. You, we, we should fight in global health for eating well. Well, I mean, uh, good for your health, healthy diet. Uh, as an affordable way of living. Why I am saying that? Because the co-benefit, the benefit both for health, saving 10 million premature deaths per year only by uh, eating what they propose to eat is good for your health, but it's also good for the climate. You know, the food and agriculture, FAO belongs now to the Quadripartite Alliance, is the food and agriculture is more than a third of all the greenhouse gas emissions in the world. It's a 
all, every day that we eat, and most 80% of these greenhouse gas emissions comes from the livestock. So if you eat less meat, you are saving your lives, your healthy lives years, and you are saving also the planet. It's not to become vegan. They don't say that. They say just do not eat as much as red meat as you, uh, as you used to, to eat. In Japan, again, where they have 10 years of healthy life years more than French people, in Japan, they eat much less red meat and much more fishes and also soya and, and, and vegetables than, uh, than the French population. Uh, yeah? But if, if I tell the story to my grandma, she would say, well, why don't, why, why, why don't you tell it to producers who pollute the environment? And I should somehow change my diet habits. Why would I do that? You mean, I, I don't understand what you mean. Uh, it's like you're saying, 37% seven, seven, seven percent is coming from our food, but we need to eat something, right? Yeah. And the place where I'm coming from, food is something that we eat all the time. I mean, we eat all the time. <laughs> and uh, I don't think anyone would want to change the diet just because we have climate change or whatever. We would be more like, we don't want to change our uh, eating habits, but rather ask the companies to reduce less carbon emissions. Yeah, in fact, uh, you see, um, each of us can play a role in reducing carbon emission. You can always say it's the others, it's not me. It's the companies. But the companies are producing drugs or com producing devices, and, and you use them too. So buying the, these uh, very uh, High producers of, of greenhouse gas emissions contribute to the pollution. But with the, the diet, you can directly, immediately contribute. And, and with also uh, physical activity, I will come to. So we are not saying to change your diet uh, completely, not to become ve vegan. If you just reduce by the, the UK, uh, just calculated that. If you reduce by 30% your consumption of meat, you will... Um, succeed to reduce by 40% the greenhouse gas emission. So it's very, very effective. So if all the population reduce by 30%, so reducing by 30% is something which is achievable. In many, uh, first of all, we have much more waste of food in our countries than in the South country. In the poor countries, they do not waste food. We waste 20 or 30 percent of our food. So just by avoiding wasting, you can you can just achieve a lot. But in addition to that, uh, it's good for your health. It's not only for the climate. If that was only for the climate, I think you were right, you are right. Nobody will follow me. But if I say you may increase your life expectancy and your healthy life years, you may think about it. And if that's not at my age, it's a bit too late. It's your, at your age that it is important to do that. Next point is sedentarity. You see, is there any Japanese people here? M the, the name Mampo Kai means 10,000 steps. It was the first polometer which was sold by the Japanese. It was a very good marketing, social marketing, because in the Japanese mind, they thought that they need to to make 10,000 steps per, per day. And now they are not doing that, they are doing 6,000 in average, and they are ranking as the, the second best countries in the world in terms of walking, and China is very good too. We are not so bad in France or in Switzerland, uh, with France I think is almost 5,000. In fact, it's a bit oversold, 10,000, step per day is not needed. S most of the studies now agree to say that uh, 4,500 is enough. And up to 7,000 is excellent for your health, for your cardiovascular health. What is important is that you will double your healthy life years by your mobility, by increasing your mobility at this stage. It's not making sports.
We are not asking you to make marathons. It's excellent, why not? It's a bit like, you know, sports is like the vegans for the diet. <laughs> you are not obliged to do sports, but if you walk more, just for, and, and every smartphone gives you the number, if you just have an average of 4,500 4, per day, it's excellent. And you will double your life, healthy life years. So that is the kind of thing, and it's excellent for the climate because it's 20% of the greenhouse gas emission, and uh, most of them are due to the individual cars. Here you have a mire which are transforming completely, which is transforming completely the city. I've seen Paris uh, 10 years ago, it does not look like Paris today. Paris has completely changed, and you are experiencing a city which is completely, uh, most of the Parisians do not like that, and I'm not, not doing politics here, I don't mind at all, but yeah. Five minutes, and after they need to talk. Okay, so I am... Huh? Okay. So, what? No, 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 she's right, really, I'm too long. So, I, no, I will not go on this. You will have the slides, huh? You know, that is all the, the 12 points. And um, head trauma, I will go on that. Head trauma. You know, uh, the, the, the UK has forbidden uh, the head on, on football uh, for all the, the young people, uh, for all the minors, it's forbidden. And even for the adults before and after the match. Uh, one, and and the, the women are complaining because the, the football, the ball itself, is the same as for the men. But their muscles are much weaker than the men's ones. And so when they have these head trauma, they have more often concussion. And head trauma with concussion leads to Alzheimer. It's well known. So please protect your head. It, it is clearly, it has been clearly seen. Okay, so uh, yeah, that, that is also important. The level, of, the level of studies. When you have no studies at all, you are more than double the risk of having an Alzheimer's disease than when you are here. So you are lucky, and I am lucky to be here with you. But you see that there is a, a, an issue, a challenge, which is equity again. We are, with health prevention, we are increasing the social gradients of health. If, you know, if the well-educated, the well-educated people, why are they having less Alzheimer's disease? It's not only because they are training their brain. It's also because they are more educated and more prone to follow the healthy diets, the, the number of steps and all the, the good things. When they are less educated, they are not so prone to do that. As you have seen, the Democrats were more prone to die at the beginning without any vaccines. And social isolation, again, and that will be, I think, really the, almost the last one. The last slide. The, the, the Moai, again, is Japanese way of life. They have Moais. Moais is a uh, group d'entraide in French. It is a, a group of five or seven uh, friends you keep all along your life, your mates, when you were at school and after your colleagues and, and some, sometimes you have more than one or two, or two more eyes and that helps you all along your life and that breaks social isolation and social isolation also when you don't have it you, have, you are more prone to have Alzheimer's disease so it's important to, to, to break social isolation air pollution you are mo most aware of that road accident you can see where the world is unsafe regarding world accident, and Africa again. Risk sécuritaire, so security, uh, because of conflicts, again, Africa is unsafe. So prevention is not a matter of doctors. Prevention, the doctors, healthcare system is 11%. Yes, it matters, but not so much. The, medic, the, the gra social gradients huh, is very, very important. The, of course, individual behaviors 
I just I don't want to change my diet or I don't want to, 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 to work more is important. Genetics, you may fulfill everything. You have never smoked smoke and you have never um, do, drunk so much alcohol and, and you may have a cancer, of course. It may happen. And environment is important, air pollution, I mentioned. My last point is this one, because it is for you. <laughs> Most of the people <coughs> may tell you, yeah, OK, with your prevention, we will live much longer. So that will be much more costly, because you will receive the pension for, for longer. How, the, world, how the, the society can bear that? It is the opposite. <coughs> and the economists have really well documented the fact that LC aging is good for the budget of the nation. Why? Because you don't need these chronic conditions to be cured for the seniors if you have healthy aging. And that is very, very expensive. You have more autonomy, lower use of caregivers. You have lower use of institutions, which are very, very expensive for the society. And because of the good health of the seniors, you have a higher participation in society. They can keep your children. They can have some activities at a political, social, cultural level. They also can accumulate their job and their pension sometimes. And they have um, also high economic impact because they, they go to the restaurant, they, they, they travel, and, and they go to the theater and so on. So uh, uh, for economical reasons, it's rather good to have LC aging. And that's all. Precision public health is my last my conclusion. Uh, precision public health is using these artificial intelligence <coughs> tools, this power of data to improve health and achieve social justice, equity, social inclusion, empowerment. It should be, it should not be feared. It should be embraced. It's what Richard Horton, the editor-in-chief of The Lancet, did say in an editorial recently. Thank you for your attention. And now the floor is yours. My apologize to be a bit long. Thank you. Some questions? Yes. So please, and after you. Uh, yeah. We need the microphone. Yeah. Ah, you need a microphone for the the question. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, you mentioned a lot of challenges of public health with climate change. Um, could you comment maybe on the problem of heat waves and uh, wealth, wealth bulb problems that some countries can face if you have something? I'm very curious to know more about that specifically. Yes. Yeah, so in fact, you have seen that this summer particularly, most of the North Hemisphere did uh, experience heat waves, which were dramatic in China, for instance, but also in India, and also in Europe, and, and in, in, in the States, and very recently in Brazil. So all the countries are experiencing much hotter climate than uh, before. Uh, heat waves is not new. It, it did happen. But nowadays, it is happening more and more. And what has been clearly seen is that heat waves, and that is true for most of the things. It is also true for the COVID pandemic. It hurts first the most vulnerable segments of the population, the elderly, the newborns, pregnant women, and uh, those who have a lot of conditions which impair their health. The, these are the vulnerable segments of the population. Heat waves are hitting them too. And so, uh, what is important today, I, I, I like to talk with uh, an audience like yours on that because it's not a matter of doctors. If we want to tackle heat waves, I'm not, of course, we, have to, we are trying, all of us, probably to contribute to decrease the carbon footprint. That is one point. But we will have anyway, whatever our efforts we are doing, we will have to face heat waves and face the consequence of the climate change in the coming future. So we have to tackle them. And cities can be built with thinking about heat waves. So needs to have 
rivers. The Seine River is an air conditioner. Having some water in the cities is very important to, to, to refresh the, 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 the air. There are some, also some pavements which are much better than others. Uh, you know the black pavements, both of the pavements are black. Black pavements are absorbing the heat and sometimes it's, it may be, in some places, it may, it may be boiling almost. You, you may burn. Uh, your hand on the, on, the, on the pavement, asphalt. And so there are some reflecting asphalt which are good way... Or, or so there are a lot of things which are not given by the doctors, but which are given by architects or by engineers. And so trying to think the, the city, the urban areas, particularly because we are most living now in urban areas, against the heat waves, against the heat is something which is uh, beneficial, beneficial for health, beneficial sometimes we need of course also to think that without too many uh, carbon footprints, so air conditioners is not the, the unique solution. When air conditioner for the elderly, for the uh, home uh, care facilities are needed of course, but if we can avoid air conditioners and improve water in the, wa in, in the city and, uh, and more green space and so on, it's also better. <coughs> so there was another one, a lady, I don't know, you, yeah. So, thank you very much. I have two questions concerning more the digital transformation part. So I study in the digital transformation major, so I'm not afraid to use digital transformation in the context of health. But I have two concerns or questions to you. The first, regarding the power of data, also the power of misuse of data, um, the biases of data, and also the security of health data, as it's so sensitive or sensible for a lot of people. And the other question would concern the implementation through digital technologies. I think you showed some pictures of the drones that are uh, also carrying medical treatment to remote areas, which is indeed a very nice way of sending uh, medical treatments. But I was wondering about the sustainability of these projects. I, I know that a German development corporation was very prone to drones, especially on the African continent, but only due to the former Minister of Development Cooperation, but after he went to UNIDO to Vienna, now um, the whole German Development Cooperation is a bit more, oh, maybe we should not, um, maybe refrain a bit more from this. So that were my two main questions. Yes, two excellent questions. Re regarding the, the first one, uh, for the, the power of data and confidentiality issues and so on, uh, I have a um, an excellent benchmark I would like to talk with you is about the UK Biobank. The UK Biobank is fantastic. You, you should really try to, to look at the website of the UK Biobank. It is fantastic. You know, the, U the UK, the British uh, people have an excellent epidemiological uh, uh, infrastructure. And now for almost 20 years, it was 2006 when it, it started, the UK Biobank sampled uh, 500,000 British voluntary people to participate in, giving their blood, giving their saliva, their urine, uh, of course, all genome sequencing, uh, a lot of data on lifestyles, on food diets. Many of the determinants I show you came from this UK Biobank. It is it has published 9,000 papers since 20 years. So it is really uh, very, very interesting. And the question of confidentiality is very, very important. It has faced very recently a debate because it has probably uh, delivered some data to uh, insurance companies uh, anonymous, anonymously, but it was not completely expected from the participant and it put some some yeah so, some questions at least among the participants so these questions are very important and needs to be uh, clearly assessed for sure but to tell you uh, it is something which is achievable so they have succeeded they have not been hacked at least they, they may have been hacked but they have always been well protected the, the 
it is very well designed and very secured. So it is possible, and I think it is a good benchmark to look at because they have really taken all the steps for maintaining the trust, maintaining, uh, it, for me it's, uh, not for me, yeah. it is the highest project, uh, long-term project uh, in the world regarding, with, with highly sensitive issues because even the, the full genome is, is given. So um, it is possible. That, that was my, my answer. Regarding the drones, you are totally right. Dr drones are so often used for military purposes that there are some reluctance and some fears from which are completely understandable and sometimes justified that these drones may, may be redirected for other purposes or maybe these drones are not accepted. You cannot deploy. You know, I told you that in Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, the the, the vaccines are not well done for poliomyelitis. You cannot use drone because drone kills them, and they will fear that immediately and will suspect that it is something from the CIA or any anyone else. So, it is not possible everywhere, but many military uh, discoveries, tools have been reused in the past for health purposes, radars and and. GPS and all many, many, many things are, were sent by rockets or by, for military purposes initially. The internet itself was a military uh, development at the early beginning. So, uh, internet like uh, things, networks. So, uh, to some extent, we should not fear that too much. Uh, when we create things as humans, we are always moving to the bad sides and to the good side. So I would say that, like I had a question about information, disinformation, and so it is true that we have to fear also the fact that uh, these tools may be badly used. We should not be naive, that is for, for true. Um, I also had a question raised uh, upon the, the example of uh, the use of uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, judging by the fact that we have to divide by five times our carbon footprint um, by 2050 and that uh, the healthcare system throughout the world and especially in the most developed and richest country emits the most, uh, how long can we uh, intensify the use of technology um, uh, directed to individual care um, when the, uh, uh, the, 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 country, uh, the countries that have the lowest income um, require probably more uh, public policies and they have a very low access to uh, intensive individual, individual care. Um, and there has been um, a quite insightful article of The Lancet uh, this year uh, showing that different healthcare system um, of the developed country emits a lot of uh, carbon dioxide and in terms of climate justice uh, how, how do you address this, uh, this yeah, question? Thank you for the question. I think it is an excellent point because um, you know if the healthcare system was a country it, will be, it would be the, the fifth largest emitter of greenhouse gas emission. So uh, you are totally right. The, and the inequity you are mentioning, Switzerland is the third most emitter in the world per, per capita. So you are totally right to say that our healthcare system is not sustainable in terms, at least, of planet conservation. So what I like, again, mm -hmm. I apologize, I, I will just have a, a look to the, to the UK. The NHS, you know, the NHS is a public uh, health care system, but the health care system is public mostly in the UK. The NHS has decided to move towards a zero net emission by 2040. So I'm not sure they will succeed to do that, but it is very interesting to, to see that. So they are, in fact, they, they, wh what they have seen is that the most the, the, the sector which is the most emitters is medicine. The drugs are the most emitters in, in the healthcare system. So um, 
but also mobility, but of course also uh, infrastructures and, and uh, uh, to heat the energy, energy needed for, for the healthcare system and, and mobility of the of the staff also every and also the diet. Every all these sectors they have looked at them to try to to set up uh, an health care, a modern healthcare system which is a zero emitter. I don't know again if this will succeed, but I think this is the right movement to have, and we should have at least for the future. We should definitely invest in a healthcare system which may be very performing very well, which may be highly intensive, providing it is a zero carbon emitter, and it is achievable. And the UK is demonstrating that it is achievable providing some change and there are some major changes which will be on drugs uh, and on drugs it's not so much because we ship the drugs by boat from China it's just because the way we manufacture drugs in China or in India is highly dirty dirty for the environment and the, so to push them because most of them are bought by big companies, big pharma companies, GSK and, and, uh, and AstraZeneca and all these, these companies are buying dirty drugs and selling them to us. Dirty in terms of <coughs> carbon footprint, but also in terms of ecology, uh, of pollution. So we need to push these companies to develop their drugs and to produce their drugs much more clean. If I may, maybe, maybe more precise, uh, and I'm, I have to um, um, to declare my interest since I'm a member of an NGO called the Shift Project that yeah. has issues uh, yeah. uh, quite a an excellent project, yes yeah. this uh, this carbon footprint for France mm. and um, um, my question is more like what is the, what is the right strategy uh, shall shall we uh, in the developed countries mm. continue to invest into uh, individual care or shall we uh, uh, stop this development, knowing that this care is the most uh, uh, nocive, the most uh, uh, I don't know, uh, consumer. Con yeah, uh, Consuming. emits the most mm. uh, and and, de and destroys climate, and climate uh, infers more heat waves affecting our elderly uh, in France and uh, developing infectious diseases, as you said. So. Uh, yeah. yeah, what is the right strategy regarding no, these issues? Okay, so the, you, you're right. I, I, maybe I was unfair to mention only the UK NHS uh, because the shift project is highly interesting. It is not embraced today by the, the, the French uh, healthcare systems in its whole. The reason why I did not mention it. But the shift project is moving in the right direction. What I like in your question is that you are addressing it in a global health meaning yeah. thinking that prevention what i mentioned with prevention prevention may decrease the needs of health care you know if you are LC, if you have healthy aging another co-benefit is that you will reduce for instance just for instance if with diet and with uh, physical activity you avoid or you delay your entry into diabetes, you will not consume diabetic drugs. And if you do not consume diabetic drugs, it is a carbon footprint which will be much lower for everyone. So to some extent, what we said, all the preventive measures are contributing to the climate, probably at a much higher way. But I would not be naive. The, the life expectancy as dramatically increase because also of our healthcare system, because of the vaccines, because of the, the, the cure, not only because of the prevention. So my thinking is that the shift project is, and the UK also, but the shift probably has thought about that more, introducing a new component for the sake of sustainability is to add prevention. In fact, the less we use the healthcare system and the less we pollute and the less we, we have a carbon footprint. So if we want to decrease our carbon footprint, being in a healthy life, healthy uh, condition is the priority. And 
second, after we have the health care, which is highly polluting. Uh, but I think you are totally right. And you know, the medical doctors don't care about the pollution. And about, the, they say, we save lives. Shut up. You, we, we save lives. And, and of course, that has a cost. But we can say, yeah, there are some examples where we can save lives with a, a much lower carbon footprint. You're welcome. Yeah, so you need the microphone. <coughs> we can go to uh, 6.30, is it OK? Or 6, what is expected? 6.30 is OK for you? Yeah, OK, we will not go beyond, but before, be, uh, up to, yeah. Um, my question here is concerning the um, preventive yeah. steps that can be that can be taken, and the way you presented some of them. Of course, time wasn't time didn't allow for for all of them. But in, in many cases, the um, preventive solution would pass yeah. by individual choices. So I should eat less meat. I should not get as drunk as often. I should smoke less, and um, and so forth. And in some of those cases, notably with um, tobacco, for example or with um, alcohol in, in Nordic countries, the government has taken action to keep the people from um, hindering their, their, life, their, their life expectancy. And my question goes in, that, uh, goes in that sense, meaning that usually people, especially young people, can be very uh, myopic regarding their... Um, regarding their, um, their yeah, yeah. I know, I know the ones I take, uh, so I can see how myopic we can be. Do you think there is a um, justification for governments to take more um, muscled approach to keep people from uh, undermining themselves? <laughs> you, again, uh, thank you for this question. Um, what is true is that um, the behavior, you see, you, you, you remember my, my figure, it's not only about behaviors. The politics uh, and policies are highly important. For instance, even for diet, if um, fruits and vegetables are much more expensive than junk food, junk food will be used by <coughs> poor people. If it is, you know, if it becomes much more, much more costly to buy some, some fruits and vegetables for your children, you will not buy them because uh, crisps are much less expensive. But, but not good. So um, we need to have tax strategies, tax reduction strategies, or making affordable and, uh, and available uh, the, good, the, the products which are good for your health. It's a bit similar for the air pollution. Sometimes you need to have strong regulations for avoiding air pollution, particularly in, in the part of the countries which are often the poor sectors of the countries. So rich, wealthy suburbs are usually less polluted than the crowded, uh, um, uh, poor suburbs. So um, yeah, the, the, the poli policies are very important. And the involvement of, of, of policies to help these preventive measures are often very important. So making accessible raising tax sometimes, and so on. The point is that in democracies, people decide. So if people think that you refrain their freedom, you know, often, the, when I, I mention, uh, I do not like to say Republican, they are not the good and the, the, the bad. You are allowed to be completely pro-Republicans in, in this room. And, and it's not, we are not in a, in a, partisan, in a partisan party here. So I, I don't need to say it is good or, or, or bad. I'm just thinking that the liberal people, political, politically liberal people, usually do not like that we refrain their freedom. And sometimes the, the public health experts are pushing to refrain these freedoms. For safety belts, for helmets, uh, it works. It has been mandatory. And during the pandemic, the, the, the masks, 
wearing, we are mandating, mandated or uh, lockdowns were maybe the restriction of freedom which was the, at the highest level. So we need to, to be aware that politicians, whatever, in democracy, whatever the, their side, their wing, uh, they need to have a consensus, a minimal consensus, or at least majority uh, behind them to promote these measures. Because mostly these measures are refraining our freedoms. Increasing tax in some products or promoting uh, or forbidding promotion of some products and is something which is refraining the freedom, refraining economies, refraining uh, the liberty. So to some extent there are these conflicts which have to be put on the table and uh, without being too partisan because we need that the whole society uh, moves to this direction but with a minimum of agreement. Yeah. Thank you for the great presentation. I had a question on um, similar uh, big data and its use in healthcare, particularly in diagnosis. Uh, when training the algorithms with data, data is usually uh, specific to a country and to a particular group of people, which is which gives great results for a country when they are diagnosing, but when trying to use the algorithms in global uh, public uh, global health context it might be faulty or biased towards uh, different groups of people for example uh, so considering retraining the algorithms is challenging and also we are at the very start of uh, this process what steps or what Mm, solutions would you suggest or mm, consider to prevent biased or faulty results uh, when we use or if we use these algorithms for global health? Yeah, I thank you for, for this question because it is true that there are some biases which are introduced by artificial intelligence tools. You did not mention them, but there are also gender biases. Sometimes there are ethnic biases. Sometimes biases towards the north and not the south population. So uh, it is uh, um, it is true. Uh, regarding diagnosis itself, there are not so many um, conditions which are completely different between Asian, European, American people. Uh, or African people. So I'm not, it is true, it may exist. It does exist that there are some ethnical specificity, but mostly they are not. And in addition to that, most of the algorithms are developed in countries which have, which have very diverse population. For instance, in the United States, there are many people coming from Africa. Black Americans are coming genetically from Africa. So to some extent, it dilutes a bit these biases. So I'm uh, not so concerned. I remember that there were some artificial intelligence algorithms during the COVID pandemic developed by the <coughs> Chinese people on a diagnosis of COVID before, you know, we didn't have any test for. And so the chest radiography uh, or MRI, MRI was able to detect or to predict that it was a COVID because of the pneumopathy. And it was good for European too when you, when you use it. So uh, I don't see so many examples where the ethnic considerations put a, a very big bias on it. What is probably true is that the learning, the, the the deep learning machine will adapt, evolve a bit with their use. And if they are used more in Africa, they will probably change a bit. What is also possible is that the quality of the radiography, which is performed in Stanford, is not exactly the same as that which is performed in Bamako. Because the devices are not the same standards and quality and if you have a very high quality chest radiography maybe you may uh, have some results from the artificial intelligence which will be different 
that if you use a more basic uh, and older device. It may, these kind of things may happen. Any, any more questions? No, no questions? No more questions? You have a right to be, <laughs> to be tied. <laughs> Last one? Maybe you could provide the policy statement. Maybe the microphone. <coughs> I don't know if there are questions uh, online, but there? Yeah? No, no, no. no? OK. Could you provide? your personal experience if you've been a part of policy implication regarding the presentation you had today so yeah so one thing is when we are here looking at the presentation yeah. another thing is when you are working in this thing and you're trying to engage in policies yeah and you have probably different perspective on it so like theory and applied so first of all I am not elected. <laughs> um, I have no mandate from any party or any uh, any um, political wing. But uh, I have been during the COVID pandemic uh, in the uh, ta scientific task force of Switzerland. So I was advising the, the Swiss government on on COVID, and I chaired I chaired the scientific committee uh, at the WHO Europe office in Copenhagen for COVID uh, again and for monkeypox. Uh, so yes, I, I have some um, role in uh, advising uh, government or European policies, European in, in the UN meaning, uh, not the EU. Uh, but um, that, yes, that is the kind of things and of course, we were, uh, as scientists, we were often uh, asked to answer to the media and to the, sometimes to the political uh, politicians. Uh, I've been regularly in contact with some politicians calling me directly, asking me what I was thinking about this situation or these proposals. Uh, some proposals were highly debated among the scientists for political reasons, like closing schools, for instance. Closing schools was something, as an epidemiologist, sometimes I thought it was useful for decreasing the, the pandemic. But I had some colleagues who had some, were younger than me, it's another bias, and they had some children, school age, and they told me, you have no children who are school aged, so it is visible because you want to, f to close the schools, but my children, they don't want school to be closed. They prefer to have COVID. They don't risk a lot with COVID. And so we had these uh, tensions sometimes, which were a mix of politics and social lives and, and uh, science. So everything was not science, definitely. Thank you so much. You're, you are very welcome. And thank you, all of you, for, for your your questions and your remarks. And that was a very interesting discussion. And good luck for, for, for the future of your career. And, and